Good morning. I'm Vicki Wynn in for Joe Fryer this morning. Happy to have you with us. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. Devastated. Ukraine and the world forced to face the horrors of war. This morning, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressing the U.N. Security Council after touring Kyiv suburbs left in shambles by Russian forces. Mass graves and mutilated bodies on the streets, renewing allegations of atrocities and war crimes against Russian President Vladimir Putin. Truth of the matter, you saw what happened in Vukovic. This warrants him, he is a war criminal. We have team coverage, including new efforts to rescue more civilians from the violence. All but certain Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson on the path to history after a bipartisan backing that paves the way for her confirmation. The surprise show of support from three Republicans in the Senate. New wave growing concerns about a new strain of COVID that scientists say could be the most contagious one yet. What you need to know about Omicron XE. And a prom night to remember for one high school senior and his very special date. There she is, his great grandmother. <laughs> we'll introduce you to the pair who broke tradition to share a one of a kind memory together. See that is such a sweet Can story. I take you to Those photos. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't imagine the reaction they got when they walked into the gym, right? And, yeah, absolutely. And what we just said, what a memory for yeah. them. We'll bring you that heartwarming story later in the hour. We begin, though, this morning in Ukraine and the fallout of those alleged atrocities in Bucha and other towns surrounding the capital of Kyiv. Yeah, yesterday, Ukraine's President Zelensky visited some of those towns to survey the damage following the withdrawal of Russian forces. Zelensky again accused Russia of war crimes, saying Moscow was trying to cover up its actions. He is expected to address the U.N. Security Council later this morning. Russia has denied killing civilians, saying it will provide what it calls factual evidence at today's U.N. meeting to prove that claim. But it seems unlikely to sway President Biden, who again called President Putin a war criminal. You may remember I got criticized for calling Putin a war criminal. Well, the truth of the matter... You saw what happened in Vukovic. This warrants him, he is a war criminal. This guy is brutal. And what's happening in Vukovic is outrageous. And everyone's seen it. Up to Allah. No, I think it is a war crime. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from the central Ukrainian city of Venezia. Gabe, good morning. So yesterday we saw President Zelensky tour Bucha. That's that town that we were just talking about. Those other towns all surrounding the capital of Kiev. And just these totally disturbing images emerged of those alleged atrocities. What was his reaction to what he saw? What was that tour like for President Zelensky? And what is he expected to tell the U.N. Security Council today? Well, Savannah and Vicky, good morning. The outrage is mounting here in Ukraine over those images. And President Zelensky has said that he believes that surrounding communities in and around Kyiv might actually have a higher death toll than Bucha. When all is said and done, authorities are still going through the damage there, trying to clear landmines, trying to find all of the bodies. That grim task still continues today. But as you mentioned, President Zelensky said to address the U.N. Security Council. And he, as he has been asking, he wants... The the West to do more, more sanctions, more weapons to Ukraine. Also, the U.S., France, and Britain are expected to present evidence of war crimes. But, Vicky and Savannah, the question is, you know, what will ultimately happen? Of course, because the U.N. Security Council, the Russia and China have vetoes, so there's a lot of debate over, you know, what will ultimately come of this. But again, President Zelensky is set to address the Security Council today. Gabe, Ukraine's deputy prime minister says seven humanitarian corridors will open today, most of them in the south and the east. But that is also where Russia's renewed focus appears to be militarily. So talk to us about how these evacuations are going, especially in Mariupol, where we've seen so much bombing and destruction. Well, as you know, Vicky, Russian forces, as they pulled out of the north, they are now refocusing their efforts in the east and the south. That there, some, according to officials, are actually uh, stopping off in Belarus to uh, reposition themselves and you know go further to the east and the south. And Mariupol, local officials there say, as we've been reporting, that more than 90 percent of the buildings there are damaged or destroyed. As you just said, humanitarian corridors have been able to evacuate several hundred people at a time over the past uh, couple of days. 
but there's huge concern really across this country about what type of atrocities uh, you know, will be found in Mariupol. Of course, it's a city roughly 10 times the size of Bucha, and it's been besieged, as we know, for several weeks. We've been speaking with those refugees coming out of that area, and there is a lot of anticipation that when it's all said and done, we'll see the same type of atrocities in Mariupol that we're now seeing in Bucha. Yeah, Gabe, the reporting that you've been doing with people who have made it out of there, the videos that they've shared with you, I mean, it's just been horrible to watch. I know you also did spend time recently with some territorial defense volunteers, people who are volunteering in this fight. How was that? What's the mood like there in light of everything that's been happening? How are they doing? Are they confident in what's to come? <laughs> Well, again, we're in the town of uh, Vinitsa, and this is a uh, several hundred thousand uh, population. It's uh, in central, west central Ukraine, uh, to the south of, uh, of Kyiv. And, you know, the residents here have been preparing for a fight. We, you know, went to, and it seems like everybody in this town is coming together to really uh, mount some sort of defense if the Russians make it this far. And while this town is far from the front lines, it has had some significant missile strikes. The civilian airport here was hit early on in the war. Um, about a week ago, uh, the central, uh, the country's central air force command in this area was also uh, hit uh, with a, by a missile strike. And we spent some time with local volunteers who are, again, trying to prepare uh, some sort of defense uh, for this town. Uh, take a listen to one of them, uh, what he had to say. Before I understood that I could uh, be more useful here than there, I've never uh, held weapons in my arms, and I wouldn't be as useful as people who are specially trained. I want to live here with my friends. I want my children to be born here and to live in, and I don't want the atrocities that we, we can see in the east of Ukraine to come here. And that was a, a young college student, actually, who was studying in Kiev, but came back home to Vinitsa here. And he was there with other volunteers filling up sandbags um, and really preparing for this town if the fight uh, were to come here. And he is just one of many people in this town, civilians, that are now uh, taking upon themselves to be ready. We saw volunteers making ammunition vests, flak jackets, uh, camouflage, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to, um, to cover up certain monuments here. And this is just something we've been seeing all across Ukraine. This, this outrage over what's taking place, outrage at Vladimir Putin, and outrage over the latest atrocities that we're now seeing in Bucha to the north. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Gabe Gutierrez, thank Savannah. you so much. We appreciate it, Gabe. Thank you. Let's talk more about the situation in Ukraine with Jamil Jaffer. He is the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute. He is also the former associate White House counsel to President George W. Bush. Jamil. National Security Advisor uh, Jake Sullivan said yesterday the U.S. is building a case for Russian war crimes with plans to announce new sanctions later this week. So what kinds of sanctions are still left? And talk about the process for actually prosecuting war crimes. It's not just up to the U.S. to hold Russia accountable. That's exactly right, Vicky. Well, in terms of sanctions, uh, Emmanuel Macron has indicated that there may be new additional oil and gas sanctions coming. Uh, the administration has a lot of options to go with, including uh, sanctions against Gazprom, Gazprom Bank, and the like. Uh, there still are a number of Russian financial and oil and gas entities that remain to be targeted, as well as a number of the more uh, sort of senior um, or wealthy uh, oligarchs they can go after individually, as well as their assets. We've seen some seizures of yachts and the like, uh, including in Spain just yesterday uh, with Victor Vexelberg. So we've seen some of that. In terms of the war crimes trials, you're exactly right, Vicky. Uh, the U.N. has got to set up a war crimes tribunal along the lines of Yugoslavia or Rwanda or use the International Criminal Court to prosecute Russia. Of course, neither the U.S. nor Russia are members anymore of the International Criminal Court, so that complicates things. Uh, so it may require one of these separate tribunals. And then once you bring charges, the problem is you've got to get the people that are prosecuted. That's the real challenge in this mm -hmm. case with Putin and his cronies. Jamil, you've been supportive of a no-fly zone over Ukraine. You've said, yeah, we got to do this. The U.S., other NATO allies have said, no, this would lead to a direct confrontation with a nuclear-armed Russia. So the argument against a no-fly zone has always been, this is, this is going to escalate the war even further. Why do you disagree with that? Well, Vicky, I think three reasons. One, one, we're seeing exactly what's happening when we don't get involved, right? We're seeing increasing number of civilian deaths increasing number of civilian buildings being targeted. We're hearing stories of rape, brutal execution-style killings, the like. It is horrific what's happening in Ukraine. 
And the fact of the matter is that Vladimir Putin respects power, and we have not shown that. We've shown uh, the, de the decision to send weapons and the like, but we haven't been willing to intervene. He sees that as weakness, and he sees that as clear way to do what he wants to do and is doing what he wants to do in Ukraine. That's a real problem. Mm -hmm. With respect to the question of a potential World War III, of course, the challenge is if we are afraid to confront any nuclear uh, power, capable of power, without force, that means China can go after Taiwan also. That's not something, that's not a message the U.S. or our allies want to convey. We need to be able to confront force with force when things like this happen. As things progress, the, the stance may change. Jamil, this morning, President Zelensky appeared to downplay a meeting with President Putin that was expected, but he does say that he expects peace talks to continue. We had been seeing some positive signals coming out of recent negotiations, but now you see what's happening out of Bucha. You just spoke to it, the atrocities there. Zelensky saw this all in person. Do you still see a diplomatic path out of this war? Look, I think at the end of the day, Vicky, there has to be a diplomatic path. The question is, when will Vladimir Putin really be willing to negotiate an end to this conflict? At the current time, he's got very limited reasons to negotiate an end. Even though he's had challenges getting to Kiev and he's refocused on the east, that's where he always wanted to be. He wanted to take the eastern provinces. He wants Odessa, that port city in the south. Mm -hmm. He still has the ability to get all those things and negotiate an end. But how does he get there? He's got to he's got to harm the Ukrainian people, try to break their will, lay siege their cities. That's exactly what he's doing. So unfortunately, Vicky, for negotiating to come, this is likely to get much worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. Well, that is not good what we want to hear, but we really do appreciate your insight and perspective this morning. Jamil Jaffer, thank you so much. And now as more disturbing details emerge from the ground in Ukraine, countless people are working to get in touch with family members they've been separated from. Last month, we talked to Zoya Chichulina. She's a mother of three. Mm -hmm. There's her family. And her family's been split up because of the war into three different locations. She's back with us this morning, I believe, from Budapest, where I think she's made it to at this point. Zoya, thank you again for taking the time to be with us. And we know you're with your two youngest children in Hungary. First, how are you three doing right now? And has anything changed since the last time we spoke with you? Uh, hello, friends. Uh, you know, we are moving into remote family mode. Uh, we learn mm. how to live in this mode. Uh, we still try uh, and make our best to stay in touch, to use WhatsApp or Skype, to talk every day, just to hear the voice, to talk about ordinary things, you know, school, lessons, movie, just to feel like a family together, but being virtually. It's hard, but it is the only way to stay together. Oh, so a remote family mode is how you just put that. I mean, that sounds like something that you hear about throughout the pandemic, remote working, that type of thing. But remote family mode is just, it's so heartbreaking to hear. Now, I know the last time we talked to you, your husband and oldest son, they were still in Ukraine, one in Lviv, one volunteering. How are they doing now? It sounds like you have been in touch with them via WhatsApp. What are they telling you? Uh, so uh, my husband is a military, so he is uh, on the front line. He's defending our country. Mm -hmm. uh, and my son, uh, I am very proud because they continue to work, uh, which means to pay taxes to the government, to the country, to use this money for uh, rebuilding and supporting army now, as well as uh, together with friends, they make some volunteering as many, many people. So, uh, you know, people try to do their best from whatever location and try to do what they can and the skills which they have in order to help. Absolutely. And have you heard anything from your husband who's actually on the front lines? What's that been like? Um, we don't uh, talk about those things, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a wife, I need to support him. So mm -hmm. I just try to bring a little bit of uh, light during our conversations. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That makes sense. And how are your two youngest doing? I mean, adjusting to whatever this is, whatever you call it, some type of new normal in Hungary now away from home. How have they been? Uh, they are going to school, which I am happy about mm -hmm. because they have some networking, some friends. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, especially in the evening, sometimes, you know, when we speak and they tell, you know, we want to go home, we want to meet, want to meet our friends. So it's not easy for them. But again, I think it's very important to keep them engaged uh, with the uh, friends here, with lessons and huge respect to Ukrainian teachers who mm -hmm. give lessons here and who also from Kiev and other cities is make online teaching to get uh, kids engaged and involved. 
Absolutely. What's it been like to find these resources in Hungary, in a country that, that you didn't live in until just a few weeks ago? What's that been like? Um, uh, we have here uh, communities of Ukrainians as well as uh, uh, local people uh, support. My friend who accommodated us supports a lot. So we try again to stay connected here. Oh, absolutely. And now I just want to ask you before we let you go with the eyes of the world on Ukraine, especially with what we've just seen coming around the, out of the cities surrounding Kyiv, those communities. What do you think the international community needs to know? What do you want people to hear? What do you want people to see? What do you want people to remember? Just two things. First is to stop continuing uh, double standards. Mm -hmm. Double standards in terms of not following values of the businesses, about doing what's right and still having business in Russia, and double standards of governments mm -hmm. telling that they are deeply concerned, but still they have ships with crude oil in European ports, and still they have gas, gas contracts are not broken. And last thing, it's not about nuclear weapon anymore. Those kids and women and civilians have been murdered, raped, and uh, tortured not with nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. It's humanity uh, catastrophe, which I think world must finally stand with us. Mm -hmm. Soya Chichulina, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. We are thinking about you and your family. We'll continue to check in. We pray everybody stays safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. We so appreciate her speaking out with us. Absolutely. On Capitol Hill, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is one step closer to being confirmed as the next Supreme Court justice and the first black woman to serve on the court. Senate Democrats, with the support of three Republicans, voted yesterday to move her nomination from the deadlocked Judiciary Committee to the floor of the Senate. This all clears a pathway for a confirmation vote as soon as this week. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell has been following all of these developments. She joins us now. Good morning, Leanne. Senate Democrats want this confirmation vote settled. They want it before the Easter recess. That's now easier now that three GOP senators have said they will vote for Judge or for Ketanji Brown Jackson. Now, what is the timeline that we're looking at from here on out? Good morning, Vicki. So the vote that they had to take yesterday was a precursor to what's going to be the final vote. We were waiting on a couple of Republicans to decide if they were going to vote for Ketanji Brown Jackson, and two more did, Senator Mitt Romney and Senator Lisa Murkowski. So that brings the total number to three Republicans, as you mentioned, clearing the way for her confirmation process or for her confirmation. Uh, Senator Murkowski, I just want to note part of the reason she decided to come out in support of Ketanji Brown Jackson, despite her admitting that it could make it politically difficult for her to win re-election this year, is because she called the confirmation process awful. Just awful is what she told reporters. She says it's been completely bipartisan. It's completely broken, and she's really frustrated with it. And that's part of the reason she came out in support of Ketanji Brown Jackson. As far as the timing is concerned, there's a lot of steps the Senate normally has to go through in order to pass nominations. And so they're going to go through those steps, and it's going to take all week. The only question is, will the final vote be Thursday or Friday? But it has become clear now that she will be confirmed to the Supreme Court, Vicki. So we are expecting that by as early as this week. Let's talk about the House, mm -hmm. uh, Leanne. It is expected to vote to recommend Peter Navarro and Dan Scavino to the DOJ for contempt of Congress. Let's, our viewers remember, these are the two advisors to former President Trump. They refused to testify before the January 6th Select Committee. So where does that process stand? Yeah, the House yesterday, they had a key uh, hearing about it, um, which is the final step before it moves the full House. And so the full House is expected to take up these two contempt recommendations this week. Now, after they vote for it, which it is expected to pass with the support of all Democrats or most Democrats, uh, then it goes to the Department of Justice and where the Department of Justice will decide if they are going to press charges on these two. And so Peter Navarro and Dan Scavino are likely, after this vote, to join Mark Meadows and Steve Bannon, where the Justice Department is considering moving forward. Now, re to remind viewers, Steve Bannon was already indicted. That process hasn't started for his trial yet. Uh, they're still waiting on uh, Mark Meadows. But... At the end of this week, there could be two more Trump administration, former Trump administration officials 
that have been referred to the Justice Department for criminal contempt. Vicki. Leanne, quickly before I let you go, the January 6th committee under a lot of pressure now to wrap up this investigation before the midterm elections. Is the plan to go to public hearings? What does that look like? The new schedule that committee members are saying is May. But, Vicki, we have heard this over and over again, and that timeline keeps shifting. Mm -hmm. So nothing's been officially announced, but we're hearing May. May. All right. Leanne Caldwell, thank you so much. Now, former President Barack Obama will return to the White House today for the first time since leaving office in 2017. He's joining President Biden at an event promoting the achievements of the Affordable Care Act, which he signed into law back in 2010. NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee joins us now. Carol, good morning. Good to have you with us. So this event comes at a time when the Biden administration has been facing some difficulties, low approval ratings, high inflation, of course, the handling of the situation in Ukraine. How important is an event like this that's touting something and with the support of the former president at a time like this? What are they hoping comes from this? It's a great point, Savannah, because this is important for President Biden. If you just look at the basics, bless you, the President Biden is unpopular and President Obama, the former president, is very popular, particularly among Democrats. And so this comes at a time when the White House is struggling to get attention to its domestic agenda, where the president is ha struggling with voters. His poll numbers, as I mentioned, are very low. Um, and so having the former president come over and serve as sort of a validator of what President Biden is doing is hugely significant. It's also going to be significant in the sense that these two haven't appeared together since last fall. President Obama has not been at the White House since leaving in 2017. So they're going to have this public display and also privately have lunch. And this is something strategically that Democrats and the White House hope is energizing and that draws attention to things that perhaps President Biden has been unable to draw attention to on his own, namely his a domestic agenda. Yeah. Now, Carol, the White House has said that President Biden will also take more action today to, to build upon and strengthen the Affordable Care Act. Again, that's what this event is about in the first place. How's the White House planning to do that and what sort of impact could that have for Americans? Yeah, this is really the meat of this announcement. And so the, what, what the White House is saying is that they're going to change a federal regulation that would expand health care coverage to millions of families. So under the Affordable Care Act, Basically, if you don't have health insurance, you can buy a plan through the exchange. But if you do have health insurance and your employer that costs you more than 10 percent or more of your monthly income, so that your premiums are 10 percent or more of your monthly income, then you can buy health insurance through the exchange. That does not apply currently to families. So if you have your spouse or your children on your health care plan, you, it doesn't, it's not factored into that 10 percent. What the president's announcing today is a change in federal regulations that will expand that to include families. So if you have your spouse or your, or your children on your plan, it will be factored into that 10 percent. That has to go through a regulation process. And if it's cleared, would begin in the beginning of January. So the president's going to announce that. And also an executive order that's really just has a lot less teeth. It's, it's a directive to agencies to help expand coverage and, and strengthen coverage in Medicare. But the real meat of this announcement is that Affordable Care Act expansion, which the White House estimates would affect about a million families. And Carol, let's also talk about what this means for President Obama. Is this any indication we could see him taking a more public role going forward, especially in light of midterm elections coming up? Well, Democrats certainly hope that's the case. This is an election where Democrats are largely seen as going on the losing end of things. President Obama is very popular. His the former first lady, Michelle Obama, is very popular among Democrats. And she has said that the 2022 midterms, you know, people need to vote like the democ or democracy is on the line. How much they'll actually be involved, the former president, former first lady, they haven't really figured that out yet. But they are going to be a presence on the campaign trail. And for Democrats, that's a real asset because mm. we've heard President Biden say, you know, I'll campaign for you or against you, whatever works. Um, he's not necessarily seen as a full asset for a lot of Democrats, but President Obama is a different story. All right, Carol Lee, thank you so much. And now taking a look at your morning news now, whether powerful storms spawned at least one suspected tornado. They're now making their way through the southeast. Bill Karens is here with that. And what else is happening across the country? Hey, Bill. Hey, good Tuesday morning, ladies. We are watching these storms moving now through Louisiana, Mississippi, into Alabama. In Dallas last night, right around 9 to 10 p.m. is when the worst of it rolled through the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We did have a tornado warning. You saw some lightning flashes. Look at this, tremendous amounts of rainfall in uh, yeah, 
The, the slogan's supposed to be turn around, don't drown, not plow through and hope that the road's not washed out. But uh, uh, that driver got lucky. Very fortunate. Uh, so let's get into these maps because we do have a tornado watch that's out until 11 a.m. The area there outlined in pink it does include the New Orleans region all the way back up into Jackson, Mississippi to Starkville. But the thunderstorms are just widespread. I've seen reports of hail-sized uh, uh, Hail-sized stones coming down anywhere from Alabama, southern Alabama and southern Mississippi. So not only do you have a threat of tornadoes, but wind damage and large hails, very common with these storms in the last 12 hours. And then the rest of today, these storms will move through the south. That area of orange is of greatest risk and maybe even a possibility of a strong tornado today, mostly concerned with the lower half of Alabama, Georgia, and the panhandle region of uh, Florida. The storms eventually head to Savannah and Charleston later on this evening and Augusta. Of course, that's where they're going to try to play the Masters as we go throughout Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The severe threat to tomorrow will shift a little bit to the north. Now, this is a separate storm, so it's kind of crazy. This first storm is today in the south. It exits the coastal the Carolinas later tonight, and then tomorrow we do it all over again. 30 million people at risk, including Atlanta to Birmingham to Chattanooga, that area of greatest risk, and a few tornadoes are possible. And then the last day of our severe weather will just be in eastern North Carolina early on Thursday, and then it will head off the coast, about 3 million people included in that. So for today's forecast, eventually rain will head into the northeast, but more or less through this evening. Uh, windy and wild in the Rockies as a you know powerful spring weather pattern continues. Not a lot of snow with this one, and no one's complaining about that. Yeah, that's true. No, I, no one, and certainly not you, Bill. That's the only silver lining I could find. <laughs> We're ready for that warm weather. All right, Bill, thank you so much. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Coming up on Morning News now, a warning from doctors about a new variant of COVID that could be more contagious than ever. What you need to know about Omicron XE. There are more sequels than <laughs> just Real Housewives <laughs> of this thing. Plus, finding brotherhood at the barbershop. More on the efforts to get more black men to talk about their mental health. That's next in our weekly check-in. Welcome back. More of our coverage of the war in Ukraine is coming up, including an, a look at the extensive propaganda efforts to build support inside Russia. But first, we're going to get to some other big news this morning. New developments this morning in that deadly mass shooting in Sacramento, California, over the weekend. One suspect is under arrest and is set to appear in court today. 26-year-old DeAndre Martin was arrested yesterday and booked on assault and illegal firearm possession charges. At least six people were killed and 12 others injured in Sunday's shooting. It was happening. It happened in a busy downtown part of the city there. Investigators believe multiple shooters opened fire following a large fight. They're expecting to make additional arrests. More than 100 pieces of evidence have been provided to investigators. Meanwhile, a candlelight vigil was held last night to remember the victims. This morning, we also have new developments in the pandemic that no one wants mm -hmm. to see. There's a new COVID variant, and that could be even more transmissible than the already highly contagious BA2. That was that stealth Omicron strain. Well, this one's called the XE variant. Here to break down what it means for us is Dr. Amish Adalja. He's a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Dr. Adalja, always great to have you with us. So, I mean, let's just start with the basics here. What do we know about this new variant, and should we be concerned? Well, the first thing is it's not really new. It was something that was described back in January. And what it is is a, a recombination or a combination of BA1 and BA2, the two other versions of Omicron that everybody's become familiar with. And it does appear that this hybrid type of variant, which was expected, does transmit more efficiently than BA2, maybe 10% more. It's unclear yet, though, what it's going to do, what it's go if it's going to spread. And the important thing to remember is the vaccines, the antivirals, the monoclonal antibodies that we're using for BA2 are all going to work against XE. And now I think we're all at this point, especially this time of year, where we're like, okay, if there's a new variant, do I have COVID? If I don't feel well, there's all this pollen, we've got crazy mm -hmm. weather going on, and then variants lingering. It's difficult to know if you have COVID, if you just have allergies, anything seasonal. What would you tell somebody about the difference between allergies and COVID, especially as testing is getting less common for some people in certain occupations? If you're not testing all the time, but you just have like some seizes, a little sore throat, something like that, what should you know? 
Well, some of the, the symptoms are going to overlap, but not all of them. With COVID-19, fevers, muscle aches and pains, all of that is going to be much more common than it would be with allergies, where you may have a runny nose, you might have a, a congestion, you might have a little bit of a sore throat. It's not going to be systemic the way COVID-19 would be. And I think fever, muscle aches, uh, all of those chills, all of that's going to be much more clear. But if you have a home test and you're uncertain, you can always test yourself. Mm, yeah, I think that that's something that we need to remember is this tool that we have. Uh, now, after weeks of bipartisan negotiations, I want to ask you about something in the Senate. Leaders reached an agreement on $10 billion for COVID relief efforts. But there's something that's not in there, and that's money for international efforts to fight the virus. We've talked a lot about this throughout the pandemic, how important it is that we tackle it everywhere, not just here in terms of its spreading, in terms of developing new variants. How important is it that we assist with fighting the virus overseas? If we're going to ever move past this virus in terms of as a species and get out of the acute phase of the pandemic, we have to get vaccination rates up higher all around the world. And now it's not so much a, an issue of the supply of vaccines, it's the logistics and the infrastructure needed to deliver them. So being able to do that is going to be critical to prevent the spread of new variants, to be able to open the entire world to travel where there's not restrictions, and to minimize the death and destruction that this virus is still going to continue until 2023. So it is really important. We think about this virus on a planetary scale rather than just thinking about country to country because we will still be vulnerable if this is out of control in other parts of the world. Dr. Amish Adalja, thank you so much. As always, we so appreciate your expertise and context here. Now it's time for our weekly mental health check-in where we walk through some of the biggest mental health headlines. I love this segment. We I also want to take a, a moment right now. Pause, take a deep breath. <laughs> I know, right? We all That was that. not a deep breath. That was a <laughs> sniff. There we go. <laughs> Reflect on our emotional well-being. Let's bring in Dr. Somia Dave, psychiatrist and the author of What a Happy Family. Good morning, Dr. Dave. Scientists are looking to understand why so many middle-aged women are using antidepressants mm. compared to men and younger women. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services says 24% of women over 60 are using some sort of prescription there. So what do you think some of these mental health challenges are that are specifically facing middle-aged women? And do you think that these medicines, these antidepressants, are the best option? So when we're talking about middle-aged women, we have to remember they're going through so much. So, so many of them are raising children. They might be taking care of elderly parents. They have responsibilities inside and outside the home. And then on top of all of that, their bodies are going through a lot. Now, mm -hmm. research in the past has shown that in those two years around menopause, the risk of a woman having a major depressive episode goes up two to four times. Oh, wow. And that number only goes up if she has had a previous depressive episode. Can I and so what we're really fine to Oh, I was, I was just sure, going to ask you sure. quickly, like, what are those signs and symptoms? Mm -hmm. How do you know if you're having a depressive oh. episode? Yeah. I think that is such an excellent question, and I really appreciate you asking that. So now when we're thinking about major depressive disorder, typically we're looking at that really sad mood, the lack of motivation to do things, lack of pleasure from activities we may have enjoyed in the past, mm. thoughts of self-harm, feelings of mm. guilt. But interestingly enough, for these women, we're seeing more anxiety, more irritability, more sleep troubles. So even the quality of the depression is different mm. from what we may have seen in the same woman before, which really points to these women needing different treatments than what are out there right now and more targeted therapies so they can get the support that they deserve. Mm. And it's so important representation in the doctors who are caring for them, who yes. can understand. Um, now, we've got a cool one out of Texas. This is kind of neat, a barbershop in Fort Worth. They've started an event called Barbershop Talk Therapy, and this is aimed at helping black men discuss some of their mental health concerns. And actually, this, there's a statistic that only a quarter of black men will seek professional help for emotional support. Why is it so important to have a place where you can let your guard down? And what's your opinion of this happening? happening somewhere, not like a doctor's office, not like a therapist's office, but a barbershop. So I think what we've seen is that so many people, too many people, are unable to get the mental health support that they deserve and they need because of stigma and then because of access to that care. Mm -hmm. You know, those two factors are so, so impactful. And so when something like this is there in the community, I think it just goes such a long way because having it at a place like a barbershop, I think it lowers the stakes in a way. Mm -hmm. It helps people feel maybe a little bit more comfortable than going straight to a doctor's office and trying to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And one thing I particularly appreciated was that Dr. Brian Dixon, who led the conversation 
conversations with the men said that it's so helpful for them to see a black psychiatrist in this space, for mm. them to know that it's okay to talk about their mental health and it's okay to be oh, seen yeah. in this way. So I think this is just so wonderful and I'm excited to see initiatives like this keep coming up. Yeah. Barbershops have always awesome. been a place to talk as salons, but it's nice to see this kind of more formalized approach yeah. where you can actually have some professional advice there. And maybe ultimately putting a name so on true. it, you know, like yeah. this is therapy and look, it's okay. Right. Like, it's, it's just it's talking. It's not scary. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Finally, doctor, that. there is a new study that shows meditation can reduce a wandering mind that leads to fewer mistakes at work and at home. Talk to us about why meditation has that effect. And also, if you want to get started, yeah. what are some easy, simple ways to do that? Yeah. yeah. Quiet that mind. Yeah. Sure. So for so long, having an awareness of our thoughts, we've known that having that awareness of our thoughts and our thought patterns can be helpful for us. And a study done at Michigan State University showed that actually it was just one 20 minute meditation session helped participants increase the ability to notice when they made an error. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just yeah. so huge that, you know, it can seem so overwhelming to start a new habit, especially something that might be different from what we're used to. But one 20 minute session having a difference really is so promising for anyone interested in it. I think one of my favorite principles of mindfulness and meditation is to notice and not judge. So we just sit with our thoughts for however long mm. we can. I think 20 minutes is a great place to start and just see what thoughts come up. Just notice them and just acknowledge them. And let's not judge ourselves for those thoughts. Let's have compassion to ourselves for having those thoughts and just see what happens when we allow ourselves to just be with them. Because I think so often in our busy world, in our very scheduled world, we're trying to just move from one thought to another. And, and it's really hard to actually just sit with those. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, that sounds hard for me. And they call meditation a practice <laughs> for a reason. So yeah, it's exactly. time totally. to, yeah, to so. get used to it. Yeah, and to, to sit, to have a thought, and not immediately get up to do something about right. it. Right, You know what I mean? Absolutely. To continue through that time. Dr. Somia Dabe, yeah, thank you so small. much. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Great to see you. And coming up, controversy at the polls. When we come back, we'll take you to Wisconsin, where new rules are in place for Election Day. Why critics say it's keeping some voters from casting their ballots. Plus, facing his fate, new developments in the sentencing trial for the Parkland shooter as jury selection begins. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. This morning, we've got the latest in our ongoing county to county series. And today we're in Wisconsin, where people are casting ballots in several local races. But new rules for this election are impacting some voters' ability to participate. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from Milwaukee with more on this. Hey, Shaq, good morning. So I know some of these new rules specifically are impacting people who are disabled with their ability to even cast their vote. Tell us what these new rules are, what that, what the specificity is there, and then just how we got here. Yeah. Well, you and I have talked before about the back and forth here in the state of Wisconsin over those unintended uh, uh, secure drop boxes that you saw across the state that became so popular during the 2020 mm -hmm. election. Well, in January, a judge sided with a lawsuit being pushed by a conservative group in this state that limited the use of drop boxes. Drop boxes for this election are no longer allowed across the state, but there's an Another part of the ruling that it's impacting the disabled community, and it's the part of the ruling where the judge says that election law in the state specifies that a person must return their absentee ballot personally, his or, own, her, his or her own ballot. They must return that ballot so, for example, a spouse can't return that ballot or a caregiver can't return that ballot. And that's what's raising alarms for people in the disability community, Savannah. And I knew you spoke with a voter who was being impacted by these new changes. What did she tell you? Yeah, her name is Martha Chambers. She, 27 years ago, uh, fell off of a horse in a mm. horseback riding accident, and she's now paralyzed from her neck down. She can't move her arms. She can't walk. And she says that she physically cannot put her own ballot in a mailbox or hand it to a postal worker, and she's being impacted by this. Listen to a little bit of our conversation. It dawned on me, wait a minute, they're really trying to eliminate my ability to vote. How so? because I physically can't put my ballot in a mailbox or hand it to someone in order for them to count my vote. You, know, you get to vote. Why shouldn't I be able to vote just like you, meaning somebody who walks around and has the use of their hands? This is someone who has voted, she said, for every election she can remember. She always votes absentee and usually gives her ballot to a caregiver to seal it up and actually submit it. And this time around, she said her vote was counted, but she didn't say how 
she actually mm. uh, processed that vote. Mm, that's interesting. And Shaq, I know disability rights advocates are speaking out about this issue. What's their take on what they're seeing? Well, they're saying it's simply outrageous. They're saying that this is not what the law is suggesting, that it's an entirely strict reading of the law. Listen to my conversation with the director of a disability rights group here in the state of Wisconsin. The same thing with the restriction on um, having someone else put your ballot in your mailbox. I think that is such an extreme restriction. It so defies common sense and honestly, you know, from an ethical perspective, it so disenfranchises people if we could safely assume that thousands of people are impacted by this prohibition. Now, I did speak to the group that actually pushed the original lawsuit that was seeking to get rid of drop boxes and uh, include these restrictions mm -hmm. that we're seeing now. And one point that he made is that uh, the, in Wisconsin law, because it doesn't allow for drop boxes, that, that's essentially what he was targeting. He wasn't targeting, he says, people like Martha. Uh, she, he says that there may be uh, op opportunity in the future for her to file a lawsuit. But for disabled voters who want to participate in this election, it is opening a lot of questions for how they can yeah, do that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Shaquille Brewster, thank you so much. We turn now to the sentencing phase of the trial for the shooter in one of the deadliest school shootings in American history. Nicholas Cruz killed 17 people at a high school in Parkland, Florida. That happened back in 2018. A jury will now decide if Cruz should be sentenced to life in prison or receive the death penalty. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson has the latest. The fate of the man responsible for one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S. history will soon be in the hands of 12 jurors. The punishment is either life imprisonment without the possibility of parole or death. Jury selection is underway in the trial of now 23-year-old Nicholas Cruz. Cruz pleaded guilty to 17 counts of first-degree murder in October for killing 14 students and three staff members at Parkland, Florida's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. I have to live with this every day. It brings me nightmares, and I can't live with myself sometimes. More than 1,000 potential jurors were on hand at the Broward County Courthouse Monday as jury selection began. The prosecution and defense now tasked with seating a jury that will decide whether Cruz receives life in prison without parole or be sentenced to death. A jury pool that large, is that normal? For high-profile cases, you need a lot of potential jurors. In this community, it's easy to imagine that a lot of jurors know victims, or no family members of victims, or simply live so close to the school that they can't get that shooting day out of their mind. Jurors won't be excused for knowing about the case, but will be asked two key questions. If they could set aside what they know of the case to be objective and whether they could impose the death penalty. The defense's mission here is present mitigation evidence and show that this is still a life worth saving. Cruz was 19 years old at the time of the shooting, had a history of behavioral issues, and had been kicked out of the high school the year before. He bought the guns he used, including an AR-15 style weapon legally, passing a background check. The shooting ignited massive protests in support of gun reform, led by some of the students inside the school on that day. Are we ready to bring in the next panel? In all, 12 jurors and 20 alternates must be seated for deliberations and sentencing to begin. As for the arguments they may hear... Look for the defense to give a statement, something to the effect of, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you don't need to worry about this defendant being at large ever again, no matter what he will be in prison for the rest of his life. If the jury is unable to reach a unanimous decision, Cruz will ultimately be sentenced to life in prison. The selection process alone is expected to last through April, with a trial slated to run from May to September. Our thanks to Priscilla Thompson for that report. It is worth mentioning that the families of the Parkland students were in the courtroom Monday. Some of them have publicly said they would like to see Cruz get the death penalty. Many of them are expected to be in attendance throughout the duration of that trial. And coming up, Russians being kept from the reality of war. Up next, a look into the workings of Russia's propaganda machine and how it's impacting citizens' views of the war in Ukraine. Plus, a high school tradition with a family twist. Mm -hmm. Our one senior stole the show with his special date. This is Morning News Now.
Much of the world has been shocked and saddened by the images coming out of Ukraine. But in Russia, the public is shielded from that reality. While the Russian government can't completely block out critical coverage, the Kremlin's propaganda machine is extremely powerful. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian explains. For those watching television news in Russia, there is no war in Ukraine, only a special military operation designed to root out Nazis. And it's all going according to plan. Those pictures of bombed out cities? The Ukrainians did it to themselves, Russian state media insists. It sounds bizarre to Western ears, but experts say many, if not most, Russians believe it. It's quite terrifying, the effect that this propaganda is having on ordinary Russians. Alexei Kovalev is an award-winning Russian investigative reporter at Medusa, a Russian independent news site. He left Moscow in early March as Vladimir Putin's government cracked down on the few remaining voices of dissent. Kovalev and others familiar with the Russian media landscape say years of disinformation by state organs has left much of the Russian public in the grip of conspiracy theories. It's now a criminal offense to call it war, and Russia is just conducting this special operation to uh, liberate Ukraine uh, from the Nazis. The latest line was with, we didn't expect that the, basically the entire Ukraine is Nazis. I'm not, I'm not kidding you, I'm not exaggerating, it's, a, it's an actual quote. Since the invasion, the Kremlin has shut down independent journalism and made it almost impossible for Russians to access Facebook, Twitter, and international news sites. But even before that, most Russians were fed a diet of lies. Eyes. Michael Wajura is a fluent Russian speaker who once played the role of token American on Russian talk shows, allowed to say a few words before being shouted down by other panelists. Michael, he left Russia with his Russian wife just before the invasion. He says the Putin government's lie that Ukraine is controlled by Nazis strikes a deep chord in a Russia that lost millions of its citizens while helping to defeat Nazi Germany. So memory of the Second World War in Russia essentially exists as the justification for the current Kremlin leadership to maintain its position. The reason why Russia is great is because it won the Second World War. That gives people some sort of identification with a fight against Nazism. Not every Russian believes the propaganda. Thousands have left the country. But those who know the truth sometimes have trouble convincing even their own relatives. We've seen uh, a lot of these heartbreaking scenes in many Russian families uh, where Ukrainian relatives uh, are calling them from the other side and telling them that the Russian army is bombing their cities and killing them. Uh, uh, and the Russian part of the family simply refuses to acknowledge that, simply refuses to, uh, to believe them, saying that this, it's all fake news. And he says many Russians don't want to confront what is really happening. It's not that this disinformation is so uh, terrifyingly effective. It's actually quite lame and stupid. It's, it's self-contradictory. But it seems to provide people a convenient kind of cushion between themselves and the horrific reality that they will have to face one day, that Russia is indeed waging a war of aggression against Ukraine. With the invasion not going as Russia hoped, its citizens are not hearing that as many as 15,000 of their soldiers have died, some of their bodies left to rot on the battlefield. As for sanctions... So they're being told the same thing that they were being told before the war, which is that the Western world wants to isolate you. They're worried about... Russia becoming too strong. Wajura believes Russia is in the grip of a kind of mass psychosis. I don't understand how this can just heal itself. I don't know how this can get better without some sort of outside intervention. A triumph of disinformation with deadly consequences. A really important look at what's going on inside Russia's borders. Our thanks to Ken Delanian for that. Well, it is time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Bertha Coombs is with us this morning. Hey, Bertha. Hey, good morning, ladies. Wall Street looks like we're going to open a little bit in the red this morning after stocks rallied yesterday. The rally led by the Nasdaq, which jumped nearly 2% as investors bought up beaten down tech stocks. We've got oil prices on the rise again this morning, crude topping 104 bucks a barrel, which is probably what's keeping a little bit of a lid on stocks on the prospects of even more sanctions against Russia and talks to revive the Iran nuclear deal having stalled. 
Meantime, Amazon is reportedly planning a chat app for workers that would ban words like union and pay raise. That according to the news site The Intercept, which says that it obtained internal documents with details on the app that would include a block list heavily focused on silencing pro-union keywords. Workers at a warehouse in Staten Island just voted in favor of unionizing. But an Amazon spokesperson tells CNBC that they are not looking at such words uh, on a list. It would be more things that would actually be more about harassment or uh, uh, that would be offensive. And the app hasn't even been approved yet. And it could still be changed or even scrapped. Meantime, order up because Savannah loves a food story. Waffle House is teaming with Adidas on limited edition golf shoes for the Masters. The Tour 360 22 by Waffle House shoes will launch on Adidas's website and app on Thursday to coincide with the first round of the tournament. They sport an off-white color similar to waffle batter, and the sides have a pattern resembling a waffle iron. The shoes will be available <laughs> in both men's and women's sizes. Waffle House is based in Georgia, where the Masters is played. So you could wear your Waffle House shoes to Augusta, I guess. That's you a know, pretty cool yeah. sneak. Bertha, at least it was a breakfast-related food story, and you don't have me thinking about Taco Bell or KFC <laughs> before 8 a.m., like, or pizza this week. <laughs> Taco Bell for breakfast is fine. <laughs> Anything for breakfast is well, fine. I'm a big believer. That? Whatever, you, whatever suits your mood. Yeah. <laughs> Waffle House is delicious. I was there yeah. for the very first time in Ohio this oh, past year. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah, they are very really good. great service. Yeah. I will say the yeah. ladies were so I nice. You know what? I, I associate Waffle House with hurricanes. Every time I've covered a hurricane <gasps> oh, in the sure. south, they are the last to close mm. and the first to open. Wow, yeah. it's so true. Huh. Yeah, it's That's a 24-hour joint, and yeah. it takes a lot to shut one down. Bertha. All right, Bert. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Well, you're going to love this story. A high school senior in South North Dakota, rather, made a big splash with his special prom date. <laughs> Their first dance brought a lot of people in the room to tears. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas has this heartwarming story. A high school gym, some neon lights, and a lot of balloons. Prom season is underway in Waterford City, North Dakota. But before his high school's dance, senior Dakota Wallen wasn't excited. Well, I've never really been a dance kind of guy. I hated him. But on a suggestion from his dad, he flipped the prom script. Instead of asking someone his age to the big dance, Dakota asked his 92-year-old great-grandmother, Madeline. My grandma had this old truck, and it's a 1985 Dodge, and she handed that down to me. And I thought that would be a great way to ask her. So I took that truck to her house and I took a poster board and I said, can I take you to prom in this old truck? And she loved it. That prom proposal a first for Madeline. She told our affiliate KFYR she doesn't remember any proms from her teenage years. Most of those years were spent working on the family farm. So this was a first. She was pretty speechless and all she could think about is why me instead of all those other girls in school. On the night of the prom, great grandmother put on her best dress and grandson his best cowboy hat. Dakota even busting out the corsage. Then the two walking into prom together. Walking beside my great grandson listening to all this music as we walked and people clapping and hollering. <laughs> For a guy who wasn't that into dances. Now on the dance floor with his date stealing the show. When they saw my grandma, everybody was saying how beautiful she looked and how many tears people were crying about. A night, and now a memory grandmother and grandson will hold on to forever. If you get the chance to do that with one of your grandparents, honestly, take it. It is one of the best experiences you will ever have. Oh, that is really sweet. There. And grandma yeah. was styling. And the fact that she hadn't experienced those proms when she was growing up and to get to do this now, yeah. truly a memory. Oh. Our thanks to Tom Yamas for that report. And that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.